Lost People. This is Dave with Lost Farms Homestead. Um, we're at the house in town right now. Um, I got a, a prepping lesson set up here, preparedness workshop, prepping basics part one. So if you find this video helpful, I'd appreciate it if you'd consider subscribing. Hit the bell icon, uh, it'll notify you whenever we release new videos. Also, uh, comments help us get through the, the YouTube algorithms. <clears throat> if you think that this video would be helpful to anyone, I'd appreciate it if you'd share it out to them and, you know, perhaps have it be a blessing to someone else as well. So. Alright, so next. Um, all levels of preparedness basic, intermediate, and advanced. These all can be broken down into four branches, uh, personal, group, or family, home, and community. And each of these can also be further broken down into four other ones. So personal can be broken down into spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical. Uh, group and family can be broken down by plans into emergency plans, shelter in place, bug out, and long-term plan. Um, your home preps, these branches of home preps, this can be broken down into physical preps, vehicle preps, security and communications. There's a lot more to this, but it all breaks down into different things here. You'll see when we get into it. So these are the uh, standard category breakdowns that I've figured for this, and then I'll get it deeper into it later. So your community breaks down in between friends, neighbors, tribe, and mag, which this, if you don't know what this is, this stands for Mutual Assistance Group. So you'll see all of this come up when we get into it. Um, so uh, let's start here in the personal branch. So all levels of uh, preparedness. So your basic, your intermediate, and your advanced all break down into personal, group or family, home and community. So your right. So um, the personal branch breaks down into physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. So your physical, uh, physically preparing yourself at a basic level is just being fit. I mean, you should exercise 30 minutes daily. Um, have a good cardio endurance. Um, at an intermediate level, physical prep is more than just being fit. You should be physically able to lift your own weight several times in succession. Uh, you should be able to run for a minimum of one mile and jog for at least five and walk continuously. At an advanced level, you should be able to run for a minimum of one mile, jog for five and walk continuously for many miles with your bug out bag on. In an extended emergency, you can expect to endure some physical stresses as well, such as injury or pain. It's very possible that you can get hurt when the first thing happens. Um, you may be suffering for an illness from an illness when the event happens or contract an illness during a situation. Um, you could experience extreme heat or cold, uh, thirst or hunger. Um, be prepared to be physically uncomfortable. Um, Many of your physical comforts may not be available uh, when, uh, whenever, whatever happens, happens. Um, mental, so mentally preparing for an emergency comes with training and preparation. Uh, the more you train for a situation, the more comfortable you'll be with the possibility of it happening. Uh, the more prepared you are for the emergency, the more confidence you'll have that you can handle it. Uh, the most important part of mental preparation other than training and having mental preparations in place is managing expectations. Most people have an idea in their mind of how things are going to go in an emergency. Um, and, you know, in that idea, they'll perform up to their expectations. However, when an emergency happens, uh, most people find out that they're only able to perform up to their ability. And almost always, their ability is severely lacking. So, as with physical preparation, you can expect to endure some mental stresses during a short-term or long-term situation such as fear, uh, anxiety, boredom, um, sleep deprivation is a big deal, um, and if you're alone, you may suffer from loneliness. So, 
Mental prep is a big deal. This is a lot of the mindset that I was talking about. And we'll get into that a little bit later on. So um, emotional, um, emotional preparations. Um, so preparing emotionally for an emergency may be the most difficult prep of them all. Um, it'll be important to keep your emotions in check during an, emo during an emergency because emotions can cause you to make rash decisions or make it difficult to perform response actions. So uh, fear can be debilitating and cause inaction. Uh, this can result in an injury or death in extreme cases. Um, having a plan can alleviate much of the fear. Um, confidence in your plans and ability will put you in a much better position when dealing with emotions during a short-term or long-term situation. Um, it's extremely important not to lose control of yourself in a situation. Um, people who are out of control in a situation are a danger to themselves and everyone around them. Don't be that guy. Uh, spiritual <clears throat> spiritual preparation. Uh, so this is different for everyone. Um, you should do your best to be spiritual at peace, spiritually at peace every day, uh, whatever that entails. Um, whenever when you're spiritually at peace, it has a positive effect on the rest of your preparations. Uh, depending on your faith or religion, you'll need to prepare for the possibility that you may lose your life during an emergency. Uh, many people die during emergency situations every day. Um, personally, I would suggest that you get right with whoever or whatever and uh, stay right if you're not already. So that's a big deal. All right, so group and family. So this breaks down into the different emergency plans. So you have your standard emergency plan, your shelter in place, your bug out, and your long-term plan. Now, <coughs> people who are gonna be in basic and intermediate are probably not gonna get to the bug out in the long-term plan. So basic and intermediate. Basic emergency plan is just like, you know, if your house burns down, you're gonna have an exit route and a meeting place. That's kind of pretty much it for that. There's other stuff that goes into it and it can get very far in depth, but people who are doing basic preps aren't gonna go much beyond that. Um, and the same thing with the shelter in place, you'll probably have like a 72 hour kit and that's about the extent of it. So this is about where the basic people are gonna be. Intermediate will be up here into the bug out plan. You might have a bug out location or something set up to in case something happens at your house and you have to leave. And then the long term, this is only going to be the people who are doing the advanced preps. So. All right, so a general emergency plan should be specific to your risk assessment. And we'll get into risk assessment when we get a little bit farther along. Um, I think that's in the next one. So like, but a risk assessment is kind of pretty much like, you know, California has an earthquake, Florida has hurricanes, you know, etc. Um, your emergency plan should also include a house fire, home invasion at the very least. A uh, general emergency plan should be sh part of your short-term emergency plan and should work together in conjunction with your shelter-in-place and bug-out plans as well as the long-term plan. So this is when I was talking about layers and layering. So like your primary plan, right, is going to be uh, like if if this is what's happening. So your primary plan is going to be your basic emergency plan. So uh, if something small happens, well, I mean, a house fire is not fall, a small, but I mean, it's not a nuclear explosion. So, I mean, if you have an emergency thing happen and you have to use your emergency plan, that's going to be your primary. So your alternate is going to be like a shelter in place. So if things get really bad and you have to stay at your house for a long period of time and you can't leave, that's going to be your shelter in place. Your contingent is going to be your bug out. And your emergency is going to be the long term. We're not planning for long term. I mean, we're, we're preparing for it, but we're not planning for it. Because the last thing that we want to do is have a situation that's a long term situation like that. We, the thing about prepping is you want to prepare for it, but you really don't ever want to have to use it. You know, I mean, it's like a, like a medical kit. You have it there in case you get cut, but you really don't ever want to get cut. 
you know, kind of like that. So anyway, so um, your emergency plan, general emergency plan. So um, they should all work together. So whatever happens in your general emergency plan should work into these, whatever preparations you have here should work into your shelter in place plan. All of your shelter in place stuff should work into your bug out plan. All of your bug out plan stuff should work into your long term plan this way in layers. So it all works together and goes to the same place in phases um, as necessary. All right, so all parts and pieces should contribute to the next step of the plans. Um, these should be written plans with meeting places, alternate meeting places, um, important phone numbers, all the elements of an emergency plan. Everyone involved should know and understand the plan and there should be an exercise or drill that's performed that includes all who will be involved on a regular basis and that being probably like once a month. All right. So your shelter in place plan. Um, all right, shelter in place is in case a stay home or shelter in place order or if chaos breaks out in your neighborhood and it's just safer to stay inside your home. The shelter in place plan consists mostly of storing food and water but should also include some additional things in case utilities or services are down. In a short term situation you'll need a larger store of food and water. Uh, you may also need to consider alternate power sources and cooking and heating methods. Um, your shelter-in-place plan should also include medical considerations in case injuries, as well as communications and security. In a long-term situation, <clears throat> you'll want to consider all of the above mentioned, as well as neighbors and community, with a focus on security and mutual assistance. Um, you'll want to know your neighbors. Meeting your neighbors for the first time in a long-term emergency situation is the worst-case scenario. So we'll talk more about neighbors and neighborhoods and all of that stuff a little bit later on, but it's important to know your neighbors and who's around you. So we'll get into that. So the bug out plan. So bug out plan is in case your home becomes unsafe to shelter in. Uh, this could be due to lack of services, damage to the structure, violence in the neighborhood. Your bug out plan should have a list of indicators to inform you when it's time to leave. Uh, your bug out plan should also include at least two bug out locations and you should have at least two alternative routes in addition to the main routes for each location and each location should be stocked with a supply of enough food and water for a short term stay um, or your plan should include bringing food and water to the location you should also have contingencies in place at the bug out location for replenishing food and water in case the short-term situation turns into a long-term situation. So, um, <clears throat> it's always a good idea to have more than one uh, location to go to. Because if you only have one location to go to, and that place gets somehow compromised, now you're not going to have anywhere to go. So you want to make sure that you have at least two locations to go to. Um, you want to make sure that you have at least two alternate routes to get there aside from the main route because if you're trying to get there and that road's blocked off or there's riots happening in the middle of all of that you're gonna have to go around it somehow so it's always a good idea to have multiple routes to each location so um, also you're gonna want to have food put up in those locations or if you don't want to or if you can't or don't want to keep food there um, your plan should involve bringing food with you. So, all right. <clears throat> so the long-term plan. So your long-term plan should include alternate energy sources, a long-term shelter at a bug out location, especially, um, you should have methods for replenishing food and water. Um, that could be like agriculture, uh, filtering and purifying water. Uh, long-term situation is the most important prep for you and your family. In a long-term situation, the most important prep for you and your family will be food, water, and security. All the preparations from your general emergency, shelter-in-place, and bug-out plans should lend to the long-term plan, 
and the long-term plan should be accumulation or a culmination of all of the other plans weaved together with additional layers for redundancy. All of this should work together to get into this at the end. So uh, we'll talk more about that and there are many ways that you can weave everything together and have it all just culminate into a long-term plan. All right. So, all right, so the home branch here, the home branch breaks up into physical preps, vehicle preps, security, and communications. Physical preparations is in reference to standard food and water preparations and an emergency kit. Along with this should be alternate sources of heating and cooling, um, alternate methods of cooking and preparing food. At the intermediate level, you should have enough food and water stored for everyone in your group or family for at least four months. In addition to a stocked pantry, you should have a secondary food and water storage such as a root cellar or a food closet. At an advanced level, in addition to the above, you should have gardens that produce enough food to sustain your group and have all of that supplemented with livestock for, for meat and eggs and milk and whatever else that you can get. So we'll get into the long term as far as physical preps. We'll get into that later. So that's a whole other thing. So, um, all right, so vehicle preps. Vehicle preparation at a basic level is just keeping a jack and a spare tire in your vehicle as well as a roadside emergency kit. Uh, you should always keep water in your vehicle. At an intermediate level of preparation, you should also keep a get home bag and a complete IFAC medical kit in your vehicle. At the advanced level, in addition to all of the above, you should keep extra fuel, uh, typical parts like lights, belts, electronical components, um, and a toolbox in your vehicle for making repairs on the road. So this all works into all of this stuff. So this is going to be a big deal for the bug out plan. <coughs> and that works into your long term plan too. So, all right. Um, security. All right. Uh, security is in reference to home security. At a basic level, an alarm is a good thing to have. Um, a firearm should also be present in the home for your protection. Um, at the intermediate degree of security, a firearm is necessary. Additionally, you should have a designated room for non combatants to shelter in, in the case of an attack. At the advanced level of security, you should also have a home defense plan with observation points and firing, firing lanes inside the home. So this, um, and what I'm talking about right now as far as home security, this is home security. Security turns into a completely different thing during a bug out and a long term plan. But at the very basic right now, I'm just talking about uh, securing your home. So we'll get into all of that a little bit later. So, and then uh, communications. So communications at a basic level is typically just a cell phone. So you should have at least one alternate form of communication. It could be as simple as a landline in your home. Also at the basic level is a television or a battery operated emergency radio or some other form of one way communication that you can receive emergency broadcasts through. At an intermediate level of communication, you may have a CB radio for communicating with neighbors or walkie-talkies for personal short-distance communications. Um, at an advanced level, uh, you may have a ham radio. So, I mean, ham radio requires training and you need to have a specific, uh, like a license to operate it. However, in an emergency situation, I think that all goes out the window. I could be wrong. I mean, I don't see them coming around and rounding up ham radio operators who weren't licensed after the fact, you know, I mean, especially if it's helpful during the situation. But um, during a non-emergency situation, you are required to have a license to operate a ham radio. So that and it's a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of time to get into it and learn how to do it and understand it. So if you don't have that kind of time to devote to that, mm, so, anyways, all right, so the community branch breaks down into friends, neighbors, tribe, and mag. That's a mutual assistance group. All right, so friends, 
So talking with friends and encouraging them to prepare for emergencies. Um, this also includes talking with your group or family um, and making decisions about which friends to allow to come into your home and to share food with in an extended emergency. In this part of preparation, the goal is to encourage your friends to be as prepared as you are. However, many of them will not be. And those that know that you are prepared may come to you looking for help. Um, and good people are morally bound to help everyone, but not at the expense of starving yourself and your group or family to help someone who didn't prepare. So you kind of got away, you know, I mean, it's, it's a difficult line. So there, we'll, we'll talk more about that too, because that is a big deal in the preparedness community is who to help and how and how much and at what sacrifice and there's there's lines so all right so neighbors all right <laughs> talking with your neighbors and creating a community plan for an emergency response um, this should include neighborhood security in the case of attack from an outside or an attack from outside the neighborhood and um, mutual assistance in a prolonged emergency situation. Um, it's important to know who is in your neighborhood, especially the ones with specific skills such as military or ex-military, police, doctors, nurses, EMT, uh, engineers, construction. Um, all of these things are, uh, uh, all of those skills can become very uh, valuable in a situation, in certain situations. Many of those can become even more valuable in a prolonged emergency situation. You're also going to want to know who the bad people are in your neighborhood. That also is important to know. So, uh, tribe. Your tribe is the people outside of family that you have a specific emergency plan with. These are the people you train with and who you expect to be a part of your group in case of a disaster or an extended emergency. Tribe is an intermediate and advanced level of preparation that begins when you share an emergency plan with trusted people who will play a part in your emergency plan, but do not reside with you and function with you on a daily basis like a family. They'll meet up with you as a at a designated location and perform a specific function in the overall plan. And their presence and contribution to the group will be worked into the short-term and long-term plans. So, those are the people that uh, are not in, are not your immediate family, but will be involved in your plan. So, <clears throat> so that's tribe, right? Mag. This is the mutual assistance group. So mutual assistance group are groups of like-minded people in your area who are also looking for people to connect with for mutual assistance during, a de during an advanced preparation. So these are groups of people outside of your immediate neighborhood who you and your group have had contact with prior to the event that have agreed to work with your group in case of an extended emergency to the mutual benefit of each group. Uh, this agreement sh could be um, trade and services between groups in order to obtain goods and services that may not be available in your group. So, for instance, if your group, there's no one in your group who knows how to do carpentry, but you need to have something built, and there's no one that can build it, and there's chaos everywhere, but this other group over here, they have people who know how to build stuff, so, you know, you cook them some food or, or give them some preserved food or something because maybe they don't have food so you give them something that they don't have and then they come and do something for you that you're not able to do or something like that so it's mutual assistance back and forth between groups alright so that kinda of pretty much wraps it all up um, this is the basics part one um, I'll get you guys a good picture so you can pause it and write this stuff down if you want to. Um, I recommend getting a notebook because there's going to be a lot of content and uh, lots of good stuff to write down. So, so let's talk for a moment about, uh, so we talked about the different levels, different categories of emergencies and situations. Um, these are all reasons why we should prepare. Um, this is kind of what preparing is, uh, different ways 
and things. These are your phases, all of everything that we talked about. So these are all reasons why we should prepare. So what is preparation and why should we prepare? So another thing that we should look at is reasons why these plans fail. Okay. So uh, a lot of the reasons why plans fail is a combination of one or two or more different things that always happen simultaneously in the middle of a situation. So one of the main reasons is uh, lack of proper or lack of working equipment. So if you're preparing for a house fire, you should have fire extinguishers. Not only should you have more than one, they should be in working condition. Uh, many emergency plans fail due to lack of equipment or faulty equipment. So you want to make sure that you have the equipment that you need and you want to make sure that it's in good working order. So uh, one of the other reasons is inadequate training. Uh, what good is a fire extinguisher if you don't know how to use it? So everyone in your house should know how to use a fire extinguisher. They should know where they're located in the house. Um, there should be a written procedure for how and when to use them. And that procedure should be practiced at least twice a year. So that's kind of a big, big deal. Um, another one is uh, inability to execute a plan due to lack of preparation. Uh, this happens, for example, when your plan is to shelter in place for three weeks, however, you only have enough food and water for two weeks. So it's imperative that you have the preparations required to complete your plan. Otherwise, you're going to need a contingency plan. So, um, another, another thing that happens is uh, lack of communication. So, say for instance, everyone's supposed to meet at the fountain in the park in case of an emergency. So this is a good plan as long as everyone knows the plan. Um, it's important to communicate the plan to everyone involved so that you're all operating on the same plan. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself standing at the fountain alone. So, communication, it's a big deal. Uh, the next thing that's a, a problem is lack of coordination. So, uh, Everyone's supposed to meet at the fountain in the park in case of an emergency, right? So if the fountain is somehow compromised, everyone's supposed to meet at the elk statue in front of the gas station on the way out of town. So if that's compromised, the dirt lot beside the interstate on Route 8, okay? So it's a good plan as long as everyone knows the order of the locations and how long to wait at each location before proceeding to the next. So coordinating the plan is essential and... Uh, it should be practiced as well. So just coordination, you know, coordination is a big deal. Um, also in this, included in this is uh, lack of current information. Okay. So assuming communication and coordination are good. So everybody knows what to do. Everybody knows how to do it in which order and, and how long to wait and all of that. So uh, following the plan, is a good plan as long as you have current information. For instance, it would affect your plan negatively if the interstate is blocked off and you can't get to the dirt lot or if there's a mob of angry rioters assaulting the gas station, you know. Um, so you got to have current information because if you're not, you know, if you don't know what's going on right now and you're trying to execute a plan, that's going to just throw a monkey wrench in the whole thing and it's just going to not be good. So, uh, anyways, these are just a few reasons why good plans can fail. So, you always want to consider uh, as many of these things as you can when working on your plans and trying to execute and making sure that everything is good. So, um, I'm going to leave it there right now. So, these are the basics for part one. And then uh, we'll continue in part two. So, uh, thanks for watching our video. Um, stick around. Stay tuned. We're going to do part two. Um, like and subscribe. Share it out if you think it will be helpful. Thanks. Mm -hmm.